refuse to limit God. You know, when you and I go down the street or the highway, we see these signs. They call them speed limit signs. And the speed limit signs are to limit how fast we go. If it says 55, you're supposed to go 55 or below, not above. If it says above that, then you go above that. If it says less, you go less. But those signs are to limit how fast we go. Now, the truth of the matter is when it says go 30 miles an hour, your car, most of your vehicles, are able to go faster than 30 miles an hour. So you have the ability to go faster than what they are telling you and limiting you to go, but you're not allowed to go any faster. If you put a fence up, if you put a fence around your yard or you, you put a fence around some area, and you can walk for a while, but then you hit the fence, the fence limits you on how far you can go. You physically could go further, but the fence is limiting, limiting you and not allowing you to go further. Well, that is the way it is with God. You and I, if we're not careful, we can actually limit God. He can go further. He can do a whole lot more than we ever imagined him to do, but we won't allow him to do it. I'm going to give you some biblical examples this morning about those in the Bible who limited God. And I want us to think about it today because are we putting a sign up to saying, God, you can't go... You can't bless me any further than this. You can't go beyond this point. This is as much as you can bless me. In the Bible, it tells us the very first man, his name was Adam. Adam limited God. God wanted to do so much more through Adam. Had Adam not limited God, God wanted to bless him with long life. He wanted to have many children. He had children, but no sickness, no lack, no anything. He wanted him to enjoy everything. He had so many blessings. He wanted to pour out even more than Adam had already had. And he was in a garden, the Garden of Eden, and it was a wonderful place to be. But God wanted more for Adam. But Adam limited God. He did not allow God to go beyond what he already was doing in his life. Adam didn't believe God. Adam didn't do what God wanted him to do. And by not believing God, by not doing what God was asking him to do, Adam limited God, and God couldn't bless him beyond what he had already been blessed. See, you and I, if we're not careful, we can go ahead and limit God. There's another character in the Bible that said, I'm taking the limits off of God. I refuse to limit God, and his name was Noah. Everybody else in the day that Noah lived were limiting God. They didn't believe God. They didn't do what God asked them to do. They did just the opposite of what God had told them to do. They did just the opposite of believing God. They didn't believe God. But Noah did. Noah said, I'm not going to put limits on God. I'm not going to put a sign up to say God can only go this fast in my life. I'm not going to put a fence up and say you can only go this far in my life. Noah said, you can do whatever you want to do, and I'm here with you. God took notice of this man who would not limit him, and God was able to do marvelous things through Noah. Noah built an ark. A flood came, and all those who limited God were no longer around. But the one who chose to not limit God float, floated above the water, and his life was spared along with his family simply because he believed God. He did what God asked him to do, and by doing that, he took all the limits off of God and allowed God to do what God wanted to do. In the New Testament, the Bible tells us that Jesus was God in the flesh. Oh, he was a human being. He had feelings like you and I, but the Bible says he's Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus kind of, well, I take that back. Jesus does, not kind of. He does represent in the New Testament how people treated God. They also treated Jesus. I'll give you an example. Jesus went around healing people and blessing people. He multiplied food and took care of people. But yet there were those who limited God limited Jesus Christ. He was on this earth, and there are those who would not receive from Jesus Christ. They did not believe that he could do it. They did not do what he asked them to do. They did not cooperate with him, and because of that, they limited God. They put a fence up. They put a fence up for Jesus. He couldn't help them. He, they put a sign up and say, not past this point. I'll give you an example. He went to his own hometown. Everywhere else, he was blessing people, healing people, doing great and marvelous works among the people. But then he went home, and in, at home, they limited him. And by limiting Jesus Christ, he could not, in his own hometown, do any mighty works. He had the ability. He could have. 
He had the power. He could have done more, but they limited God. It wasn't Jesus limiting himself. It was those in his hometown who limited Jesus and would not allow Jesus to do what Jesus had the power to do. As a matter of fact, in Mark chapter 6 and verse 5, it tells us about that. It says, and he could there do no mighty work. I want you to notice as you look in your Bible or on your e-pad or on your, on, your, on your phone or whatever you're looking at or on the overhead, I want you to notice the very important, the wording that's there. It's very important. It says, and he could there do no mighty works. It doesn't say that he, he didn't want to. He wanted to. It didn't, say, it didn't say that he couldn't do mighty works other places he had. But it says here he could not do any mighty works. The reason he could not do any mighty works amongst them, he laid his hands on a few sick people with headaches and they went away, but he wasn't able to do any mighty works. They had put a fence up. They had put a speed sign up. They had said you can only go this far. We think you're that, oh, you're that son of Joseph. You're that son of Mary. You're that carpenter. Your brothers and your sisters live amongst us. Amongst us, it was his hometown. And they limited Jesus Christ. It says later on, as you read along, it says, he marveled at their unbelief. He could not believe how they didn't believe him. You and I can put a speed sign up for God and say, you can't go past this area. We can put a fence up and say, we're limiting you here. You can't do it. His own, Jesus' own hometown, limited God. They didn't believe Jesus. They didn't cooperate with Jesus, and they did not allow Jesus to do what Jesus could do. He had been doing it everywhere else, but they limited Jesus. Today, I want to remind you, point one today would simply be this. You can limit God. You can, in fact, limit God in your life. You can put a fence up and say, you can't bless me past this point. You can put a fence up in your life and say, you're not allowed into this area. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 78 and verse 41, it makes it very clear what I'm saying to you thus far. Everything I've said thus far, this scripture puts a stamp of approval on what I just said. Everything I've said up to this point. I've shown it to you in the word of God. I've shown you how it is. But I want to give it to you in the word of God where God himself, remember the word of God is God speaking to men who wrote the words down. So this is God himself speaking. Now he speaks, say he spoke to me, and I'm writing it down. A holy man of God wrote it down as the Holy Spirit spoke to them. And this is what God wanted us to know in Psalm 78 and verse 41. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. It says right here in the Bible that they limited God. Let's refuse to limit God. You and I can put signs up that say you can't go this far. You can't do this. I don't believe you're able to do that or we can take the signs down. The Bible says here that the Israelites limited the Holy One of Israel. He wanted to do more for them. He could have done more for them But because they did not believe him, because they did not cooperate with him, because their attitude wasn't right, he was unable to do what he could have done for them. They limited, the Bible says, we just read it, they, not him, they limited the Holy One of Israel. They put a fence around and said, God, you can't touch this area. You're not able to do this. But let's talk about that for a moment. We're talking about the Israelites. They had been held in bondage in Egypt. And then God delivers them out of bondage. He was able to do that. Then they got to the Red Sea. The Red Sea is before them. The enemy is in back of them. There's mountains on both sides. How can they get across? And all of a sudden, God parts the Red Sea. He was able to do that. Then they're out in the wilderness, and they're hungry. They're starving. So they call out to God, and God brings manna from heaven that drops out of the sky 
and lands on the earth. In the morning, they go out and they pick it up. In fact, I, I was trying to figure this out, and I kept looking it up. I was multiplying and dividing and multiplying and dividing, uh, and, and I was doing all kinds of things. And finally, I, I read after somebody else and said, oh, this is easy now. Um, it, would, it would have taken 4 million pounds of manna a day to feed the Israelites. The mathematician that figured all this out, a Jewish mathematician, said this. It would take three freight trains and each one a mile long to deliver all the manna that was needed to feed the Israelites. Four million pounds of manna every morning fell on the ground. And yet they limited him and said he couldn't do something more. Quail, they were hungry for meat, and quail was brought to them, and they ate quail. Water came out of a rock. He brings them right to the edge of the promised land, and they limit God. It's a good time for you and I to start thinking what God has already done in our lives. For you and I to look back, maybe he has not dropped four million pounds of manna into your backyard, and maybe he hasn't had water come from a rock, but maybe he has touched your life. Maybe he's done something for you. Maybe he's turned a situation around for you. I know it's true in my life, and I know it's true in many of your lives. Many of us have been touched by God. Many of us have, are alive because of God. Many of us are walking and breathing because of Almighty God. Where did it happen? Where did we start drawing the line and saying, well, you blessed me there, but you can't bless me here. Or you blessed me here, but you can't bless me here. Where did we draw the line? Where did we put the sign up that said you can't go beyond this point? Where did we draw the fence and say, God, you're not able to do this? The Israelites had been delivered from the Egyptians. The Israelites had walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. The Israelites had been fed by four million pounds of manna every morning for 40 years, by the way. And yet they still couldn't believe God. They still drew a line in the ground or in the sand. When they saw the promised land, they look over and they, they sent some spies over there. As you know the story, 12 spies went over. Ten of them had this report over in Numbers chapter 13, verse 32. And I want you to know, I want you to remember this. This is the Word of God. This is someone who's writing what God tells them to write. And God's watching over the shoulder of them as they write to make sure they're writing exactly what He says. And this is what God says over in Numbers 13 and thir verse 32. And they, meaning the ten, brought up an evil report. Turn to somebody and say, an evil report. When you and I, now listen. When you and I draw the line and say, God can't do this, that's an evil report. When you and I say, God can't go beyond this, he doesn't have the power to do that, that's an evil report. What God is saying is an evil report is when these Israelites who've been delivered from Egypt, who'd rock across dry land going through the Red Sea, who'd been fed with four million pounds of manna every morning, all of a sudden said, I can't believe you. When you and I say we can't believe him, that's an evil report to God. When we say you've done this but you can't do that, that's an evil report to God. It's evil because it slaps God in the face. It says, God, you're not able to do this. I love when we say things like God is more than able. God can do even more. God is an abundant God. Nothing is impossible for God. That's the right report. My God can't do this. My God's unable to do this. Oh, God didn't do it here. He can't do it there. Yes, he can. Somebody may have drawn a line. Somebody may have put a sign up. Somebody would have put a fence up. I don't know, but my God can do it. Amen? It says in verse 32, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they searched into, the land of the children of Israel, saying the land through which we have uh, gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. The land that God promised them. The land that flows with milk and honey, 
They're saying, oh, it's an evil land. And it eats up the inhabitants in the land. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. It's not true. Not all the men in the land that they had looked at were giants. There were some giants there. But not all of them were giants. But the way they saw it, everything they were facing now became bigger. And God became smaller. Have you allowed God to get small in your eyes and the problem to get larger? Are all the situations you're facing giants? And is your God a midget? Have you allowed God to become small? Drew a line around him and said, you can't go be out of this little box, God. And your problem is huge and your problem can go into every area of your life. It's not time to limit God. It's time to refuse to limit God, and it's time to put the limitations on the challenges in our lives. Amen? Amen. They didn't believe God. The Israelites didn't believe Him. God could have blessed the Israelites. God could have brought them right into the promised land, ushered them right in, defeated all the giants that they did see, which not all the people were giants, but they refused. They limited God. I want to encourage you today to not limit God. God wanted to bless the Israelites. His whole desire is to take them into the promised land. He wanted to bless them so much he had prepared that land for them. But they limited God. Again, in Psalm 78, 41, Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. You and I, can, in fact, limit God. Let me talk to you about some things that come up in my heart and come up in your heart at times. It's one would be fear. Fear can cause us to limit God. We say things like this. Well, God's mad at me because of what I've done. He can't do this for me because I've messed up. If you've ever messed up in your life, if you've ever sinned, if you've ever uh, blundered, if you ever did the wrong thing, said the wrong thing, thought the wrong thing, uh, just raise your hand. Now look around the room. Leave your hand up. Look around the room. I'm shocked my mother's hand is up. I, I don't know what that's about. I don't even know what to say about that. Oh, she pointed at me. I guess I'm the thing she did wrong. Fear tells us that God can't do something in our life because of something we've done. Fear tells us that we have fallen short so God is going to fall short. Fear tells us because we have sinned, God is not going to bless us. But there's two characters in the Bible I briefly want to talk about. One is the name Peter. Peter had denied his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, three times in the night that Jesus Christ was taken and was going to be crucified. He said, I don't know that man. I don't know that man. I don't know that man. He denied Jesus three times, not once, not twice, but three times. He had walked with Jesus. He had talked with Jesus. He had seen Jesus in the physical. He had touched Jesus. Jesus Christ had fed him. He had seen food being multiplied by Jesus. He had seen blind eyes being opened by Jesus. He had seen withered hands healed by Jesus. He had witnessed Jesus raising people from the dead. And yet that night he limited himself and limited God and said, I don't know the man. He had sinned, fallen short, made a mistake, did something he shouldn't have done. Maybe you've walked with Jesus. Maybe you've talked with God. Maybe you've come to church. Maybe you've read your Bible. Maybe you've seen great things take place in your life, but you did something. And now you're in fear that you've limited God and he can't bless you because you've sinned. I want you to know that God forgives. And in this story of Peter, think about this. The day that Jesus rose from the dead, the women went to the tomb, and they, they, they saw an angel there. And the angel said, go tell the disciples that he will meet them in a certain area. And he said, oh, yeah, and also tell Peter. Can you imagine Peter waiting and thinking, I don't deserve it. I denied him three times. He's got to be upset with me. He doesn't want me. I've made a mistake. I can't, I'm not qualified anymore to even work for Jesus, be with Jesus, talk to Jesus. He's dead, and I've messed up. I, I'm going to hell in a handbasket. It's all over. I have definitely have committed the unpardonable sin. I, I know it's all over. 
And then the women show up. They answer the door. We saw Jesus. And an angel told us that the disciples were supposed to meet him. Peter steps back. I've messed up. You guys can go. I've blown it. I should have never got involved in that situation. I should have never done that thing at work. I knew better than, you know, they always tell us that our politicians are, and now I become like that. They always tell us preachers are like that, and now I become like that. They always say that, and now I'm one of them. My hands are dirty. I can't, I don't deserve. And Peter's going, I don't deserve. And the angel goes, uh, Peter, the women say, Peter, the angel said to let you know, come. Today I want you to come to Jesus. Today I want you to come to God. If you've made mistakes, if you blew it, if you said something you shouldn't have said, if you got involved in something you should not have gotten involved in, if you did something you shouldn't have done, Almighty God would say, come, come. Don't limit God's forgiveness. Another character was the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, he went around before he was an apostle. His name was Saul. It's easy to remember S, Saul. He was S for sinner before he gave his heart to God. P, he was made perfect by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Paul had killed Christians. Paul had put in prison Christians. Paul, or his name was Saul at the time, had done things that just weren't right. It would be like my family sitting eating dinner, and all of a sudden he would come in with some soldiers and rip me out of my house and rip my wife and my children one way and me another way and imprison me there and imprison them there and separate us. He had done that to Christians. And one day he had a visitation from Jesus Christ himself. First he heard his voice and he, he must have thought, oh my God. Oh my God, I thought I was serving you and I've been missing it all along. Oh my God, I thought I was doing the right things for, for you, God, and now I understand I was doing the wrong things all along. Sometimes we get caught up in religion and we start doing things just to do them because that's the way they did them. And we mock other individuals and we make fun of other individuals because we're right and they're wrong. And that's what Saul had been doing. And when Jesus showed up, he said, you were wrong. Saul said, man, I've been imprisoning people. I've been doing terrible things. How can I allow God in my life? And Jesus said, I'm going to send someone to you. And someone came to him and said, Ananias comes and says, I've been sent by God to lay my hands on you and pray for you and to lead you into the kingdom of God. God's calling out to you. Maybe you've mocked Good News Church. We had a group for a while that were against us. I don't even know what I ever did to get them against us, but they were against us. I don't know why. Maybe you've made fun of other churches or other people. God's coming to you and saying, hey, don't let that fear stop you. I forgive you. Turn to somebody and say, you're forgiven. Don't let your sin be a fear that doesn't allow God in. Some say this. It's not fear, pastor, of something I've said or something I've done. It's, it's a fear of, well, you know, I'm just not smart enough. We have people say, you know, great Christians have to be really intelligent Christians. They have to, you know, be the smartest person in their class. They have to be graduated and have a graduate degree. They have to be a doctorate degree. They have to be this. They have to be that. Well, someone didn't tell God that because God sent Jesus here to this earth and Jesus went around. Oh, he picked out Luke who was a doctor, but most of them were uneducated, unlearned men, and he used them. My friend, if you say, I'm not smart enough, that's a limitation of the devil. He's trying to limit God in your life. You're smart enough. Besides, you and God, you're way smart enough, amen? You are smart enough because God, don't. Don't put a fence and say, I'm not smart enough. Don't let that fear get in you. You are smart enough. God used uneducated and unlearned men. The religious leaders at the time looked at the people, the apostles, and said, who are these people? 
Who are these people? They, they are unlearned, uneducated, ignorant. They call them ignorant men. And yet those uneducated, unlearned men turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ because they didn't limit God. Don't limit God because of mistakes you've made. Don't limit God because of your lack of education or your intelligence or whatever it would be. You can be used of God to do great and mighty things, and many have. Many say, well, it's not because of my intelligence. I think I'm intelligent. It's not because I've made mistakes, because I've received forgiveness from that, but it's my nationality. God uses certain nationalities, but not all. Well, that's not true. I like the word of God. One of the first things that happened after Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, they're, they are sent out to different areas. One is sent to the Samaritans, to Cornelius. A man called Cornelius is what we call a half-breed. Not totally a Jew, not totally a non-Jew. He was what we call a half-breed. And yet God sent the gospel message to Cornelius so he would understand. So they would, uh, I'm sorry, Cornelius was a Gentile. And the message went to the Gentiles. But it also, God sent the message to the Samaritans, the half-breeds. So if you're a half-breed, if you're a Gentile, if you're a Jew, if you're tall, if you're short, if you're white, if you're black, if you're brown, if you're any color in between, God loves you and God can use you. Don't allow your nationality, your color, your height, your education, what you've done, don't allow that to hinder you, God, God, I love this story. There's an Ethiopian eunuch. Ethiopia, that eunuch, is traveling along. Remember, and the man of God goes to him. The Ethiopian eunuch was black. He went to half-breeds. He went to blacks. He went to whites. He went to Jews. He went to non-Jews. Let me tell you this. Don't allow fear I'm not smart enough. I've made mistakes. I'm not the right nationality. Stop you. Tear that fence down. Take the sign down and let God move in your life no matter what your nationality, no matter what your educational level is, no matter how many mistakes you've made and God has forgiven you, God can still use you. Amen? Amen. Give God a hand clap for doing that. Fear in those areas and fear in others will stop us. But also a thing that will stop God or put a limit on God in your life is a thing called doubt. I want to talk to you about this. Doubt. He can't do it. Doubt. Maybe he can. Yes, he can. No, he can't. That's called wavering. The Bible says no. Doubt will stop God from being able to move in your life. Remember, the Israelites were unable to receive the total blessings because they doubted God. Adam was unable to receive the blessings he could have had because he doubted God. Past failures can bring doubt into our lives. Past failures that you've had and also past failures that others have had. And we start to doubt them. Maybe he can't do this. Maybe he can't do that. Let me tell you a story in the Bible that I find very interesting. The apostles, say apostles. The apostles have been given by God, by Jesus Christ, the ability to cast out demons. They have been casting demons out left. They've been casting demons out right, left, right, left, right. They have been casting demons out. And then one day, a little boy came, and they went to cast the demon out of the boy, and they were unable to cast the demon out of the boy. I don't know. God, Jesus tells us it was because of their unbelief. They had allowed their unbelief to slip. They, they started limiting God. They were unable to deliver this young boy of a demon. Jesus goes ahead and delivers the boy. The apostles were unable. So we could look at it and say, if they're unable, their failure now means I'm going to fail. No. Don't let other people's 
things that look like failures stop us, let's get back on the, the horse, as they say. Let's get back on the race, as they say. Let's get back doing what we know to do and let God do what he wants to do and let not our past failures or someone else's past failures, because we don't know the deal, let us move forward and not limit God in Jesus' name. Amen? You're not next to get sick. You're not next to die of sickness. You're the next one to get healed. You're the next one to pray for someone who is sick. You're the next one to bring deliverance in somebody else's life. Get back up, dust yourself off. And you know what the apostles did? After Jesus went on, they went around casting demons out of everything that had a demon. I mean, if a dog came by with a demon, they cast it out. If a cat came by with a demon, they cast it out. They cast demons out of birds that flew by. They cast a demon out of everything. They were demon cast outers. Oh, they had made some mistakes, but they had learned, I'm going to cast me a demon out. They said, well, let's go find us a demon and cast it out. I want you to say this, past failures by me or by others are not going to limit me. I am refusing to limit my God. Give God a hand clap. Another thing, doubt, unforgiveness, past failures, and then logic. Let's talk about logic. Logic, people try to apply logic to the Bible, and it's faith. The Bible has logic in it, for sure, but it's a faith book. Let me give you some examples of, of how people stop God because of logic. They, go, they say things like this, 12 men are supposed to preach the gospel? What kind of a impact can 12 men have? Logically, that's stupid. Logic says, how can a woman who is a virgin give birth to a baby? Logic says, no, that's impossible. Logic says, how can Tim Rome's become a minister? Well, the life that he was, the sickness that he had, how could he become a minister? See, 12 men turned the world upside down for the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Forget logic. Let's let God move. A little girl, 16 years of age, gave birth to a baby when she was a virgin. Logic had nothing to do with it. The power of God had everything to do with it. Amen? Logic said, Tim Rome's is going to die, and God said, no, we're not going to let him die. Logic said, he can't preach. And God said, oh, we're going to have him preach. Logic has nothing to do with it. Tear the fence down of logic. So he says, well, let me logically tell you. you forget the logic. I'm going to kick your logic down. And I'm going to let, let God move. No logic, no sin, no forgiveness, no failures. I'm going to take all those fences down. And let God move. Amen. I refuse to limit God. We said you can limit God, but let me talk to you now that you can take the limits off of God by believing. You can take the limits off of God by believing God. You can take the limits off of God by believing God. The way Adam put limits on God is he didn't believe God. The way you and I take limits off of God is by believing God. Jesus Christ himself said in Mark chapter 9, 23, notice what he says. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe all things. Everybody say all things. Take the limits off of God by believing God. Don't be a no, don't be a Adam. Don't put limits on God. Be like a Noah. I'm taking limits off of God. Jesus said unto them, if thou canst believe all things. Say all things. Now watch, it doesn't say all things are impossible. It says all things are possible. Look at somebody and say, your situation can change. Turn back and say, you can pray for the sick and they can recover. Go ahead, say it. If thou canst believe, Jesus said, if you can believe, what's been going on in your life to try to steal your belief structure? Somebody else's failures? Some of your failures? Logic? What is it? Doubt? Throw it away. Get rid of it. It's a fence trying to stop God from moving in your life. 
Jesus says, if you can believe, tear the fence down, take the sign down, allow God to move. If you can't believe, he said, all things are possible to those who believe. Amen? Why don't we just say, I'm a believer? Now, if you don't mean that, that means you're a liar. But uh, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, it says this. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Refuse to limit God. Choose to believe God. Choose to believe that all things are possible with God. When doubt comes, tell doubt to get out in Jesus' name. When fear comes, tell fear not to get near in Jesus' name. Tell it, leave me alone, get away from me. Don't limit God, limit fear. Don't limit God, limit doubt. Don't limit God, let God move, amen? All things are possible to those who believe. With man it's impossible, with God all things are possible. I don't have all the answers on why and why and why and why, but I have an answer, God and God and God and believe, amen? Amen? Uh, point number three is simply this. You can take the limits off of God by being willing to do what he asks and then doing it. You can take the limits off of God by... Now, I want to make sure we say this right. By being willing to do what he asks to do and then doing it. You can take the limits off of God by being willing to do what God asks you to do and then doing it. There are two different things, being willing and doing. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19, it says, If ye be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Obedience triggers release, but willingness triggers reward. Obedience triggers release, but willingness triggers a reward in your life. God wants heartfelt cooperation. You've heard the story. I've told the story. Some have, some have repeated it back to me, but a little boy's at the table. He's standing up in his chair. His dad says, sit down. The boy won't sit down. Father looks over at the boy and says, I told you to sit down. The boy won't sit down. He looks back over at the boy. Sit down, I'm going to spank you. Boom, the boy sits down. He looks at his dad and says, I'm sitting down, but on the inside, I'm standing up. (laughs) Being willing and obedient means you do it, but in your heart, you're okay too. Being willing and obedient means I make a heart change. Yes, God, I'm willing to do it. The Bible says this, don't give grudgingly and out of necessity to God, for God loves a cheerful giver. What does that mean? Don't obediently do it but not willingly do it because you lose your reward. Don't just give and go, no, give and make yourself inside be willing. Amen? Change the inside and say, I'm going to be willing from now on. I'm going to be willing, not just obedient. I'm going to change my attitude on the inside, and I'm going to be willing. It doesn't take that long to change it. You just go, I'm going to be willing. I'm going to be willing. I'm not going to just give. I'm supposed to forgive others. I'll forgive them but I really don't want to. Change that. Give. I'll give, but I really don't want to. Change that, because you could give until you give everything away. If your attitude on the inside is wrong, you may be obedient, but you're not going to eat the good of the land because you're not willing. Change the inside and say, I'm going to be willing and forgive. I'm going to be willing and give. I'm going to be willing and do what God asked me to do. I'm going to usher not because I have to, but because I want to. I'm willing to do it, and I'm also obedient to do it. I'm going to work on the staff not just because I have to. I'm stuck. I wish I could get out of it. I said yes one day, and now I wish I could get out of it. Change your attitude or change and get away because it ain't helping you anyway. You want to be willing and obedient. Amen? Amen. Turn to somebody and say, change that. Amen. We've got, I said it before, a, a guy by the name of Kenneth Hagen that I've read it, a lot of his stuff and I've listened to him. Uh, Kenneth Hagen says he was talking to God one day and he's asking God why something's not happening in his life. And God speaks to, he said God spoke to his heart and said it's because you're not because of Isaiah. He said, what do you mean? I do it. He says, you've been doing it, but you haven't been willing. 
So the blessings aren't there. You've limited me because of that. And Hagen says, it took him two seconds to change his heart to being willing. <laughs> Once he realized, he said, man, I changed it. I said, heart, start being willing. And immediately the blessings started to flow. Don't just be obedient, but also change it to be willing. If you're coming to church, don't just come obediently. Come willingly and say, I'm going to enjoy myself and have a good time. Amen? Amen. Let me just read to you from the Word of God. From Luke chapter 5, I'm going to start with verse 1. And it came to pass that as a people passed up, pressed upon him to hear the word of God, speaking the people came to hear Jesus Christ, he stood by the lake and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them, and they were washing or cleansing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon, it would be Simon Peter's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down in the boat and taught the people out of the ship. Now, I've been there to the Sea of Galilee they're talking about. I've been there, and uh, they, they try to show us why Jesus did what he did. You know, Jesus is smart. There's a lot of people pressing him, and if he's on land and he tries to talk, it's one thing. But if he can get into the water where the, the, the waves are going this way, Everything's going that way, and now you're out there studying, and he has that water in back of him, and he's speaking to you. You can hear him better. So he knew this. He got in a boat, went out there, and now he's talking, and everybody can hear him. In verse 4, it says in Luke 5, And when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, Simon, whose boat he had gotten into, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a drought. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night. Sometimes I say that to God about a building and other things. We've been looking and looking. Sometimes you say that because you've been tithing, or sometimes you say that because you've been doing something for God and the blessing hasn't come yet, and you're going, God, I've been doing this thing. Now watch. And have taken nothing, nevertheless, Bless at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they, he became willing and obedient. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ships, and they should come and help them. And they came and filled the ships, so that they, both ships, began to sink. They've been fishing. All night. You don't fish during the day, you fish at night. They were, daytime, they would fix, and fix their nets and mend their nets. They're sitting there, and Jesus comes along. There's a couple teachings here. Jesus says, I'm going to use your boat. Simon says, Go ahead. And when you give to God, God blesses you back. So you get back a whole bunch of fish. He says, Go ahead. He gets in his boat, he's out there. He gets done, he says, Okay, now I want you to go back out and fish. I've been doing this for a long time, Jesus. We don't fish at night in the daytime. They see the net coming, they run her. We were fishing all night. We'll go out tonight, maybe, but we didn't catch it. And Jesus said, do it. Simon said, okay, I'm going to believe you. We fished all night, caught nothing, but nevertheless, I'm going to believe you, God. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to take the limits off of you, God. Maybe, maybe God is talking to you right now. Maybe there's something that God wants you to do. Maybe you have been doing something and haven't seen the results. Maybe you have done it and done it and haven't seen the results, and so maybe you've given up. Maybe you're on the seashore sitting there going, I already tried that. I went to church before. I did this before, and now I'm just going to sit on the sidelines. And maybe through this message, maybe pray for someone. You say, I prayed before and didn't see the results I wanted. Maybe something like that is going on in your life. And I want to encourage you. Be willing. Be obedient. Hear the voice of God. Lay hands on the sick. Pray for people. Don't forsake the gathering together of God's people as a matter of some are. Be part of a church. Be part of this church. And let's believe God for a great harvest. Now, I love what happens. They don't just catch enough fish for themselves. They start catching such so much fish 
because they're willing, obedient, and they believe God. They took the limits off of God. They take the limits. They refuse to limit Jesus Christ. His hometown limited him, but they're not going to limit him. And all of a sudden, by not limiting him, by not allowing their past mistakes to stop them, their doubts to stop them, by not allowing their nationality to stop them, by not allowing all that to stop them, they're now believing. They're doing it and believing. They were doing it before, but now they're doing it and believing. Now they're doing it with the right attitude on the inside, and now the fish fill their nets so much. Help! Help! Andrew, bring your boat! Bring it out here! They, they get so much fish. We're going to load our boat first. Oh my goodness, we've got so much fish. Here, you take it. And they take it. Oh my goodness, we've got so much fish. Both, now listen to what it says. Both ships are about ready to sink. Take the limits off of God. Don't allow past failures to stop you. Don't allow all the toiling that you've done in the past to stop you. This message is saying, believe God again. Take the fence down the devil's place around you. Take it down. Believe God again. Trust God again. Refuse to limit our God. And let's receive a boat load, boat sinking blessings from God in our lives. Amen. Give God a hand clap. The Israelites limited God by what they believed and what they did. Noah refused to limit God, took the limits off God, and he was blessed. Peter refused to limit God. Peter was blessed. We go to the story of Joshua. He believed God, and he was blessed. What wall? Have you put up what wall of unbelief, doubt, fear, hurt? What wall has been placed around you by our enemy? What wall have you and I placed around ourselves? Let's take it down this morning. Let's take the sign that says God can't do. Let's take that sign down and step on it. Let's say I'm going to believe God and I'm willing and I'm going to be obedient and do what he asked me to do. Let's get rid of the limits. Let's take the signs down. Let's tear the fences down. Let's say, I'm going to refuse to limit my God. 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 Kenneth Copeland, how many people here ever heard of Kenny? (laughs) I said that to sound cool, Kenny. How many here have ever heard of Kenneth Copeland? Kenneth Copeland, I was reading after him, he said, you know, I was praying for people and they were dying. I was praying for people and they were dying. I was praying for them and they were dying. I said, God, what's going on? He says, continue. He said, I kept on praying, kept on praying, because the word said it, the word said it, the word said it, the word said it. He said, every, all of a sudden, things turned around. People started getting healed. People started getting blessed. He said, you got to keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. Don't, get, don't give up. Don't allow the devil to put a fence around you. Keep on doing and keep on doing and keep on doing and keep on doing. Amen. My pastor, Pastor Sumrall, said, if everybody in my congregation died of sickness today, tomorrow morning I'd get up and preach healing because it's in the Bible. I don't understand everything, but I know what the Word says. You say, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, he said, I'm not going to limit God. And he blessed people, healed people. I'm one of the people he prayed for. I'm one of the people Pastor Sumrall prayed for. I'm one of those individuals he laid his hands on. He's the one who laid his hands on ordained me. I thank God that he didn't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't quit praying. Don't quit. Don't stop. Don't limit God. Refuse to limit God. Amen? Amen. Stand with me if you would, please. God is good. God is good and his mercy endures forever. Good news, church. By us moving out of that one building, us looking for another building, Satan's tried to put a fence around us. He's tried to get us to believe that God can't do what God's fixing to do. By people going on to be with the Lord, 
Satan tried to put a fence around us and tried to say God can't do what God can do and what God has done. Today I'm going to ask you, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. Why don't we say this? If you are willing to say it, would you please be obedient and say this? Heavenly Father, Good News Church is taking down every sign that says God can't do it. We're tearing down every fence that says God can't move beyond this. And we're stating with our mouths we refuse to limit God. 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 Now let's make it personal to you, to me. What is it? What fence or what sign does Satan put up in your mind or in your heart that stop God? A speed limit sign. Car's able to go, it's not allowed to go. The fence, you're able to go beyond it, but you're not allowed to. Let's believe God. For you, I don't know what it was It stopped. I don't know what it was in your life. Maybe a disappointment, maybe a dad, a mom, a this, a that, a, a sin, a mistake. Why don't we just say this personally? You say it for you. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I'm tearing down the signs. Tearing down the signs. I'm ripping up the fence. Ripping up the fence. I'm allowing you to move you. anywhere in my life. In my life. I'm, trusting you. I'm trusting you. I can do all things, can do all things. Through, Christ through Christ who strengthens me. All things are possible, things are possible. to those that believe. I'm believing. I'm believing. With God, With God. Nothing, is impossible. nothing is impossible. Come on in, God. Come on in, God. No, more fence. no more fence. No more signs. No more signs. I, refuse I refuse to limit you, God. Move in my life. Move, my life. Move, through, me. Move through me. And I thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In, Jesus name. in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You've got a hand clap.